Hi, I'm the MedPot Combat Engineer, Term John Termel. <clears throat> And back in 2000, Terry Parker got a declaration out of the Ontario Court of Appeal that declared Section 401, Possession of Marijuana, to be invalid, the prohibition against it. Then in 2001, the declaration took effect, but they wouldn't admit it for two years. And then two years later, they finally admitted that the law had been dead since Terry Parker Day in 2001, and they dropped all the remaining 4,000 charges. But they would not expunge the 100,000 bogus convictions during those two years, and I call that the Terry Parker scandal. I appeal that all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and they let it stand and covered it up. Now we have Terry Parker who got his pot seized after being searched by Canada Post and they said that without an exemption he can't have his pot back. Now Terry's got a deathly fight of doctors who did some operations on him for his epilepsy that, and of course he's been bad mouthing so long what doctor wants to associate with the Terry Parker. So if the odds are 60 to 1 against finding a doctor who signed for marijuana in Ontario they're a lot higher for Terry Parker. So I've always told him, Terry, we got to fight for a system where your doctor and all doctors have to provide so that poor sick people aren't forced to doctor shop to find the one in 60 who'll sign. And that's the horror going on right now. So the application to, for the return of the pot to Terry Parker, based on several grounds that the law is dead because of this and that and that, all laid out in this case law and past cases, went to Justice Clement, who refused to issue his pot and basically ruled that Terry is no longer protected. And we've appealed that now to the Superior Court of Ontario before Justice Michael Tullock, who took the decision under advisement. And recently, the Svetkopoulos case happened to strengthen our case that when they reintroduced the two conditions back in 2003, December, that had been ruled unconstitutional earlier in 2003, October, that that was making the law turn off again. And now we have the Supreme Court of Canada that let the Svetkopoulos decision stay and strengthening our case, the law has been dead since 2003, and Parker should have the right to his pot back. So I took the decision to search the archives at the Supreme Court of Canada to get the Crown Attorney's memoranda on their application for leave to appeal and for a stay of execution to see what they said the Svetkopoulos decision really meant. And now, I've sent this letter, this writ, last written representations on Svetkopoulos to Justice Tullock. It arrived this morning at court, if it was priority post worked. And now I'm going to be reading to you Terry Parker's case for the return of his pot, for the declaration that the law has been dead all these years, for them dropping all grooming charges, for them erasing all bogus convictions, and for them basically declaring the law is, as of right now, dead and still dead. Superior Court of Justice, Criminal Division, file number SCAF 2484-08, between Terence Parker, Appellant, and Her Majesty the Queen, Respondent. Supplementary Written Representations on Svetkopoulos. 1. JCT, me. Enclosed are Appendix A, Supreme Court of Canada Memorandum of the Crown Attorney Sean Godet in the Svetkopoulos case, aided by James Gorham for their recently dismissed application for leave to appeal. Appendix B, Notice of Motion and Memorandum for Stay of Execution pending appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. C, Appendix, Order Granting the Stay of Execution pending further order of this court. The order granting the stay is unsigned, but Crown James Gorman would know who signed it. Appendix D, Konigsberg J, ruling, severing two flaws in the MMAR in B.C. Supreme Court. Two, in the memorandum for leave to appeal, the Crown says, one, the Federal Court of Canada has interpreted Section 7 of the Charter as conferring the right to obtain marijuana from the supplier of an individual's choice, notwithstanding the existence of an effective licit supply of marijuana provided by a government-licensed supplier. If left standing, the decision... B. Revives arguments that the defense of marijuana possession in Section 4.1 of the CDSA is constitutionally invalid, despite this court having settled the issue in R. v. Malmo Levine. GCTI answered, So, now left standing, the Svetkopoulos decision revives our arguments that the offense of marijuana possession in Section 4.1 of the CDSA is constitutionally invalid, and Terry should get his pot back. 
The Malmolavin decision only stated that government can prohibit a controlled substance, not that it did after the Parker and Krieger invalidations took place. Four, the Crown, paragraph 33, the judgment in this case may create confusion concerning the constitutional validity of the prohibition against the possession of marijuana as set out in section 4 of the CDSA, and therefore compromise existing prosecutions under the CDSA. And I said, perhaps necessitating an expunging of the 300,000 bogus convictions from the victims' criminal records over the past six years? Five, Crown, in R versus Polzer, for example, a prosecution currently underway in BC Supreme Court, defense counsel has argued that by virtue of the Ontario Court of Appeals judgment in R versus JP, the invalidation of Section 41B1 of the MMAR retrospectively invalidates Section 41 of the CDSA in respect of marijuana. Uh, till, back till 2003. Crown. Even law and I said, even lawyers are catching on to the fact the prohibition became invalid when the exemption became invalid. Crown. The court in R versus JP ruled that the combined effect of Parker and Hitzig meant that there was no constitutionally valid marijuana possession offense between July first, thirty first, two thousand and one, Terry Parker Day, August first, and October seven, two thousand three, Alan Young Day, the day he brought it back to life. They say. The date the MMAR were constitutionally rectified by the decision in Hitzig, thanks to Alan Young. Courts may construe the Federal Court of Appeals decision as creating a similar period of retrospective invalidity dating back to December the 3rd, 2003, the date that Section 41B1 was reintroduced into the MMAR. So I said it's what we've been asking the courts to construe too. So in the applicant's notice of motion for a stay of execution now. Now, these are the documents here we got out of the Supreme Court of Canada archives a few days ago. Crown, paragraph 5. If the order is not stayed pending the proposed appeal, the public will suffer irreparable harm. Courts of criminal jurisdiction may interpret the order as retrospectively invalidating the offense of marijuana possession in CDSA section 4.1. And I said, in the applicant's memorandum for a stay, the Crown says, one, Federal Court of Appeals declared Section 41B1 of the MMAR constitutionally invalid. And I said, now the Supreme Court of Canada let that stand. Eight, uh, paragraph eight, the Crown says, 17, the Court has recognized that there's a public interest in avoiding harm to users and others caused by marijuana consumption. The effect of the judgment of this court is to jeopardize this public interest in two ways. Two, courts are being urged and may interpret the FCA's judgment as retrospectively invalidating the offense of marijuana possession, trafficking, and or production in sections 4, 5, and 7 of the CDSA. And I said, how can cultivating something legal be illegal under section 7? And how can trafficking in something legal be illegal under Section 5? And how can possessing something legal have an illegal purpose under Section 5? You know? Nine, the Crown says, point two, the public interest in maintaining the offense of provisions of the CDSA. 21. Members of the criminal defense bar have argued that Section 4 of the CDSA is retrospectively invalid as a result of the judgments of the courts below. And JCT said, and non-members of the criminal bar way before then. 10. Crown. For example, defense counsel in R versus Polzer appeal before the BC Supreme Court argued that the FCA's judgment means that Parliament failed to implement a constitutionally acceptable scheme for ensuring illicit supply of marijuana for medical reasons, as required in the Ontario Court of Appeal in Hitzig, and that the prohibition of possession of marijuana is therefore of no force and effect. While this argument was rejected by the court in that case, this has not prevented it from being raised in other prosecutions. In a judgment issued on February 2nd, 2009, without written reasons, Justice Konigsberg of the BC Supreme Court declared that Section 41b1 of the MMAR to be unconstitutional on the same grounds as the FCA in this case, but suspended the declaration of invalidity for one year. She went further and on the same ground struck down Section 54.1 of the MMAR, which restricts the number of licensed growers who can grow in common. 
That's R versus Baron, February 2nd. And that's case 131900 and BC Supreme Court. 